not too long ago, to be Irish was to be Catholic. But recently, the vote to legalise same-sex marriage and liberalise abortion has many questioning the influence of the church in everyday life. Has the shift in social attitudes also loosened the Roman Catholic grip on the hearts and minds of its Irish congregation? You're watching Roundtable with me, Shuli Ghosh. Since 1991, the percentage of people who identify as Catholic in the Republic of Ireland has dropped by around 13%. Several scandals involving the church over the last few decades has also weakened its moral authority. What is the future of the Catholic faith in a more secular society? <laughs> Once considered a conservative country ruled from the pulpit, to be Irish was to be Catholic. But church scandals and constitutional challenges have seen a profound shift in social attitudes. Are Irish Catholics losing the faith? Ireland's constitution inextricably links the Catholic Church with the state. The clergy had broad influence over Irish society throughout the 20th century. But in May, Ireland voted to overturn the Eighth Amendment, which bans abortion, rejecting the teachings of the Church. Today is a historic day for Ireland. A quiet revolution has taken place, and today is a great act of democracy. The vote is the latest move towards more socially liberal policies. Ireland decriminalised homosexuality in 1993, after a case that went all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. The introduction of divorce passed, but only just, in 1995. And three years ago, Ireland endorsed same-sex marriage with a vote of 62%. All seen as signs of the church's weakening moral authority, the referendums also coincided with a series of sex scandals. The abuse of young children and the subjugation of unwed mothers are thought to be the strongest reasons why Irish Catholics are abandoning the church. Because of the scandals, and because of, of, of the cover-up of those scandals. And, and I think they have lost a bit of confidence, and maybe even a lot of confidence, in our church. Ireland does remain a strongly Roman Catholic country, but the number of faithful are slipping. In 1991, over 90% of the population identified as Catholic. By 2001, that figure dropped to 84, and in the last census in 2016, 78% were devoted followers. There's also been a rise in the number of non-believers. Roughly one in 10 indicated they had no religion, a 73% increase since 2011. There's a growing gap between the culture of Ireland that's developing and the church. When Pope Francis visits Ireland in August, many will be watching to see how much fanfare he receives. Can the church find new ways of staying relevant in an increasingly secular society? Or will it retreat further from its dominance to a more humble role? Some might suggest that's exactly where it belongs. Well, joining us from County Meath near Dublin is Sharon Ty Mooney, author of What About Me? Women and the Catholic Church. In R.D. County Louth is Bernadette Fahi, a psychologist and survivor of institutional abuse at a Dublin church or an orphanage where she was sent to at the age of seven. And here with me in the studio is Gwen Moroni, an activist who campaigned for the abortion ban in the Republic of Ireland to be overturned in the recent referendum. Good to have all of you with me. Uh, Bernadette, let's start with you because you spent most of your childhood in a church-run institution. Uh, you've written a book about it, you've taken part in a documentary and you've likened that experience to being in a concentration camp? Well, that might sound extreme to somebody who hadn't been through that kind of experience, but when you spend 10 years of your life, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, for nearly 10 years, believe you me, you have a good idea of what it is like 
Yeah, it, the, the experience sounds appalling. And when you came forward to talk about the violence, the abuse that, that you'd suffered, were people prepared to listen? Was it difficult to speak out against such a, an all-encompassing power as the Catholic Church? Well, I think it's, it's only fair to say that my experience and our experience was that the vast majority of people did, in fact, believe us because there was anecdotal evidence. People lived near these institutions. People saw children. Um, but it's also true that uh, a significant minority did not appreciate, as they experienced it, uh, our uh, criticising the church. Some people said we should have been grateful, uh, that we were being unkind and untruthful about our experiences. And um, so we had to live with that. Because at that time, the church pretty much controlled everything. Uh, health, education, orphanages, uh, you know, even, even what social norms were. They did. And um, I think that around this time was the beginning of the breaking down of all of that. Bearing in mind that um, most people, well, a significant number of people were being um, better educated than um, heretofore. Uh, free education existed for secondary education. So more people were being educated, more people could see, and more people were questioning. Sharon, uh, it's fair to say that there was a time when the, the power and the influence of the church was present in everything, in all sectors, and actually shaped people's lives, particularly the, the lives of women. Yes, I would think that is definitely the case. And I think it is women that have driven uh, most of the change in Ireland as well, because it is one area in which the church had a, a very strong hold was in everybody's uh, personal life. And then when the church was found to be abusing children, an area in which they had been most vocal, I think women especially felt particularly betrayed. And I do think that the church still has no idea of, or little idea of the actual effect of abuse on the laity and how they feel about it. And I think they've also failed to understand that for uh, people who were parents of children who were of the age that were abused, um, which are the next generation, I don't think they realize the impact it has had on them. And I think that's why the younger generation uh, feel particularly strongly about it as well. So the, the, the whole, the, the series of scandals completely eroded trust in mm. the church as an institution. Yes, uh, and I think they underestimate the scale of that to this day. Do, do you agree with that, Gwen? Is that yeah, from I, your experience on the ground? I definitely agree with that. There is also an article in the constitution that states that a woman's place is in the home. It's Article 41.2. So. Um, it actually says it that. states that what well, yeah. I'm summarizing it, it it's it's a little bit more um, complex in that it, the state acknowledges that the woman's place is in the home and therefore she doesn't have to, to do fair, work. The Catholic Church isn't the only organization that absolutely has said things like that in the past. Um, so it's it's um, on, on top of the abuse scandals. We are just slowly moving away from a patriar patriarchal frame of reference because the common good that that article talks about has spread a little bit. It's not the common good of Ireland. We're going global a little bit and immigration in Ireland is, has increased a lot. So we're a lot more multicultural. There is a lot more realities that the Catholic churches can't relate with. So, so Sharon's so making the point that um, the church in particular shaped uh, women's lives. Exactly. There was a lot of control over their bodies and what they, they could or couldn't do. Um, so it, is it, do you, particularly with the, uh, the referendum uh, mm. recently on, on repealing the, the Eighth Amendment, which is a step towards liberalising abortion laws, um, do you see that as because women are now taking a, a, a step forward in, in asserting their rights against the church. Yeah, definitely. Like what what happened, I think, is the deaths that were caused by, let's say indirectly by repeal of the eighth, really changed people's minds because there's there's been there was a lot of high there was a, cases. There was a lot. There's Savita, Bimbo, Michelle Hart, 
um, which was less talked about, but she was a cancer patient who was told you can't you can't keep this baby, you need to have an abortion, but we don't have abortion in Ireland. So as she travelled to the UK, she missed her treatments and she, she eventually died. So these things added up, obviously, for, for men as well. I've talked to a lot of men in Ireland that were, you know, they were like, look, I know it, it could be our baby as well, but do you know what? It's women's rights. That's what we're, that's what we're backing. I think the change now is that women are actually backing women's rights. Uh, women and men are backing women's rights. It hasn't really happened before. Like the, mm. the, um, the, the new generation now is obviously carrying the work that's been made before, but there's, there's a new energy of, of, of helping out women now that wasn't there before. That's also because I think what the abortion referendum did, it opened the doors to other, other themes like abuse and rape. And domestic violence, which is really and these high. Are things that people didn't talk about. Um, no, because <laughs> because we're actually socially Catholic. I, you know, you 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 don't have to identify as Catholic to, to think Catholic, if you know what I mean. Like especially with all the stigma that come that has come with, uh, all the stigma towards homosexuality and abortion. That that that's social Catholicism. The social teaching of the church has been massive throughout the years. I mean, we could start talking about the mother and child scheme. You know, um, I don't know, I don't know, so it, yeah, there's lots there. <laughs> power and influence is such that it, it shapes the way you think. Do you yeah. agree with that, Bernadette? I do, and just as you're uh, just talking there, I'm thinking back to when we started first to bring the issue of institutional abuse to the fore. I was really conscious at the time that I was dealing with civil servants initially who were all educated by religious. So you had to get through that hurdle, you know, pass through their filters before you could get to politicians. And they too had been educated largely by religious orders. And that was a real difficulty. I was really conscious of it at the time. It was an uphill battle. And the irony is that when we made uh, Dear Daughter, the documentary that first exposed this, that the producer was a Jewish man, you know, and it's only a Jewish man could have done it <laughs> at yeah. that time and got away with it. Yeah. That's not to say he didn't get a hard time. He did. But that but tells it, you everything. Even this, this act of, of questioning the church. I mean, it's such an it's such an opaque institution as well. And as we saw from the you know the cover up that happened after the abuse scandal, um, they really close ranks, and yeah. it, so it, it becomes this almost impossible um, you know monolith that that people are, are trying to take on. Well, well, Sharon, what's the, the sort of um, experience been in? Uh, coming up against that and, uh, you know, and trying to, to make your voice heard in the face of a, a church that, that supports its own? I'd say that's been very, very difficult. And I think it, it's also been one of the most disappointing things about the church is, on, I mean, there's corruption in all sorts of man-made institutions, but we do expect a church to have higher standards and when they do cover up and act like any other institution, that again is doubly disappointing because the whole point of a religion is to have a better way, to treat people in a better way and have these ideals. And when the church itself is so fallible in its dealings and hostile even, and I think that is the case that the cover up, people found that extremely difficult to deal with. I think for me, one of the main problems has been that the church has been unable to adapt. It, it's, um, mm. it is now, I mean, it, you know, it, it's taking part in compensation schemes and it's, uh, and the Pope, Pope Francis has come out and, and, you know, expressed sorrow for what's happened. But for so long, the church just refused to, to do or say anything or even accept that this was an issue. And that, to a certain extent, has been part of its, its downfall um, in well, terms of trust from people. Ireland is quite small as well, and there's a lot of emigration. And we've, well, for abortion anyway, there's always been the safety valve, which is the UK. So in a way, it was quite, let's say, easy for, 
to sweep things under the carpet a little bit, like until numbers started coming out and campaigning started being a lot stronger after all these deaths. So it was inevitable that it had to come on the table and be solved, you know. And um, po politicians so far haven't really cared much about the influence of the Catholic Church as well. That's the thing. Like, the Cat but isn't there yeah. now a move away? Yeah, 100% oh, now, government. but it took a long time. Like, it, it's the Catholic Church has been in healthcare, education, and legislation since Ireland is a republic. And it hasn't, it hasn't changed since recently. So it's, it's crazy how quickly it's changed over the last 10 years, I guess. You know, because when I left Ireland, it was about 15 years ago, and we still had a prayer in school in the morning, and sex ed was like one hour every two months. <laughs> you know, what? One hour. <laughs> one hour. You know, and it's like girls use condoms, that was it. Because, you know, uh, contraception was only legal in the late 80s, wasn't it? So... So is it, uh, from, from your point of view, um, you're both still in the Republic of Ireland, have you seen changes? Because the, the church uh, was controlling, um, uh, as far as I know, is still controlling the, the mm. large majority of education, but has it stepped back from, from other institutions in, in Ireland? Well, I would think its influence is lessening in those terms. And I think for the simple reason, again, that they don't take on board the importance of bringing with women with them. Because if women are not on board, they don't bring their children to church. And uh, anecdotally, um, a lot of women of the younger generation, let's say 30s and 40s, would find at best, they would say they're indifferent to the church. And at worst, they think it's evil uh, because of the abuse. And as well as that, we also have women are not allowed to be ordained in the Catholic Church. They're still uh, discussing whether we can even be deacons. And like they don't realize, I think, how much the alienation of women actually matters because it was the women of Ireland who did perpetuate Catholicism in Ireland and without their support uh, I don't know I don't see where the church can go let me let me and read this um uh, there was a, a consultancy firm, a global consultancy firm, who actually uh, did a commission study on, on forecasting the church's trajectory over the next 15 years. This was a study done in 2016, and they found that attendances at mass are set to fall by a third between now and, and 2030. That's on top of a 20% drop um, between 2008 and 2014. And there is likely to be a fall of up to 70% in the number of working priests uh, and the ones that remain, most of them are going to be over the age of 60. I mean, to me, that says that the church is, is facing a crisis uh, yes. in its, its very strength and presence. Um, Bernadette, does it surprise you that a growing number of people are not identifying themselves as Catholic anymore? In fact, a, a, it's a minority, but it's a growing minority, say that they're atheist or agnostic or a-religious. It doesn't surprise me at all. It was bound to come, it was bound to happen. The thing, um, just going back to the issue of the uh, people, uh, the church not being with the people, I think it's more that the people left the church rather than the church is not with the people. The people left the church and they left it in droves uh, largely as a result of the abuse, but also because of uh, other social issues like um, you know, hospitals and schools and um, abuse has happened in day schools too, of course. And people remember that. And um, it's also true that uh, women uh, have largely led these battles and women have had no role or place in the church except as flower arrangers and cleaners. And those days are gone and uh, women are not willing to put up with those kinds of um, roles and um, demeaning behaviour. So if there's no yeah, place for them, they're It's still pretty reluctant to have women priests, though, isn't it? I mean, maybe well, you'll you have see, to think about women priests, given that there's, there's so few people becoming priests. It'll never happen. Mm. Never mm. happen. They'll bring priests from Africa and elsewhere, as they yeah. do now. They will never have women priests, I believe. I would agree with that. I mean, I spent many years researching that topic for my book, 
And one of the things I, I suppose I was quite shocked at uh, was how strong the antipathy to women are yeah. from the Vatican. Mm. They really don't want us. Mm. That, that seems extraordinary to me. Uh, mm. And it's, it's also not just the growing strength of, of women. Um, Ireland was also the first country to legalise same-sex marriage in 2015 mm. by a, a big vote. So uh, yeah. different minorities are now coming to the fore. Yeah, we, it, mm. which is something that happened during the campaign. I think everybody came in with their cause. And that's why the yes was so strong. As well as, personally, I think it's because people made their mind about abortion a long time ago. Otherwise, it wouldn't have won by this much. And it was like, let's just do it. Let's just do it. This mm. is this is we had enough. Like, um, there's a there's a group called Merge, which is migrants and ethnic minorities for reproductive rights. That they bring a really valid point about abortion and migrants, for example, because a lot of people don't have travel issues. So if they travel for abortion, they might have to apply for a visa, which takes six six weeks, and a lot of birth deaths happen to be migrant deaths. Like, there's a lot that comes with the New Ireland, which is, we're, you know, our horizons are expanding clearly from mum, dad and kids, which is a Catholic frame of reference. So we know? talk about people losing trust, losing faith in the church. Mm -hmm. Does that mean Ireland is slowly becoming more secular? Do you see a time when there will be, uh, you know, None of this overriding influence? One hundred percent. I think so. I think especially with abortion coming down, like a lot of stuff will have to be first of all answered for, which is the abuse. Um, mm. I think like that's that's gonna blow over the next five years at least. And the laundries now as well, like a lot of people that weren't through the laundries have come back recently in Dublin for a meeting about it. And there were, you could see these women were like, okay, so now people believe us because you wouldn't have been believed that you were locked up in a laundry because you were raped sometimes, you know, because it was your fault if you were raped, this of course. Was a, yes, another scandal. Yeah, which the last laundry <laughs> shut in 96. I was in secondary school, but then, you know, it's it's quite scary. Um, I also think that as as soon as the church comes between you and healthcare, something's going to change now. Like, you, you can't, it's not the 50s anymore. Um, I mentioned the mother and child scheme earlier. In the 50s, there was a really high in infant mortality in Ireland because we were poor. Because uh, the Brits had just, well, we just got rid of the Brits and you have to build the country again. So this Minister for Health brought in a free healthcare for mother and uh, mothers and children up to the age of 15 and um, family planning advice. That's when the church came in and said no. <laughs> right. And doctors yeah. followed because we're like, we're going to lose our job, jobs if we say yes to this. We'll get less money. We might, the church had a lot of power. And it still does because some doctors have had to resign over the repeal the 8th over the last two years. Mm -hmm. So that, I think now it's, it's just it, your basic health care needs have to be met. You're seeing this ground. And, and the church has mm -hmm. to get off it. Like. And, and, so. and, and do, you, do you ladies both agree that the, the future of the church in Ireland is looking increasingly uncertain? I don't think it's uncertain yeah. at all. I think it's quite clear it's on its way out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the church have to do? What does Pope Francis have to do to try and, and stop that? Did, is it a question of complete root and branch reform, which seems unlikely at this point? Well, I think well, you I could think, start... Yeah. Sorry, Sorry Brian, I think go ahead. ahead. I think you could start with apologising to victims of abuse, uh, yeah. both sexual and otherwise, in institutions run by religious. And I think that um, he could meet with them. And I think he should do that worldwide. And I think he should um, uh, allow women priests because that would alter the face of the church completely. Well, Pope, Fra Pope Francis did uh, this year, he became the first Pope to publicly denounce the culture of abuse of, uh, uh, and cover-up in the Catholic Church. He said he was ashamed that he and other church leaders had never really truly listened to the victims of the sex abuse scandal. Does that, does that help? Is, is that, a, is that a, clearly a step in the right direction? But is it enough for you or, or does a lot more happen? No, it's not enough because he's also denied abuse where in, in a, other countries where it turned out it was true. And um, I, I just don't think they take it seriously yet. I don't think they've got it. I agree with Bernd. I think it's optics because yeah. at, there's no sense at any time that they look to themselves, that they look to the training of priests, 
they look at their anti-women stance. Uh, you have on the one hand they're out preaching pro-life and at the same time then abusing live children who didn't fit the, quite, exactly. the right criteria. So there's an awful lot of hypocrisy and people can see that now. And, you know, just pretending that we're still uh, people who had this simple faith, which is what they congratulated themselves about for many years, is just naive at this point. And it's one of the reasons, I think, why the change from such um, loyalty to, to the church has changed so rapidly in Ireland, in that when there was scandals, when there was problems, uh, there was no depth of faith. We seem to have dropped it very, very quickly. Yes, yeah, so I think the overriding message seems to be that the church has to uh, spend less time supporting uh, itself, protecting itself, and more time protecting those uh, who have been hurt by the church. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, good to have all of you with us. Uh, really interesting discussion. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. That's it for this edition of Roundtable. Until next time, bye for now.